So we're looking at uh, you know rates, things like rates of reaction or rates of cooling, whatever. And um, if we take a look at the concentration of A versus time T, you know we could have something that has a constant rate. It would be a constant rate. And this rate doesn't change over time. And so the rate is uh, how fast this reacts, A reacts with time. How fast A reacts with time, we can get from the slope. And that would just be delta A over delta T. In fact, the rate of reaction here is just equal to the delta A over delta T. And it's how fast. Although the rate of reaction is going to be a negative because we have a negative slope. And so normally we don't like to think in terms of negatives, so we'll just put the absolute value sign here, delta A over delta T. And so this would have a constant rate. Well, the constant rate, it's easy to predict, you know, how fast things react. You know. If we rearrange this, you know, we call um, delta A is, uh, or Y, delta t is our x. And so here, um, what we can get is uh, we can get an equation for y final. And that is um, here. Let's just look at it. This is equal to constant. In other words, um, you know, the, the equation for this line is just y equals mx plus b. And so the concentration of A at time t, let's say, is equal to the slope you know, delta A over delta t times x. x is t, the total time interval. plus eight times zero. And so this is just rearranging this, you know, where the constant is just slope. Which is this, slope. And so with this, we can make predictions. For example, you know, how long does it take for a certain percentage of reaction to occur, let's say 95% reaction. So if we started off with well, 1, we'd be down to 0.05. We can figure out how long it takes because of the, the constant rate. But if we have a changing rate, then it's more difficult to predict. And so this is a changing rate here. That is, um, initially, it's, it's kind of fast, but you can see it steeply declines, and then it slows down, it kind of flattens out, as it slows down here. And so you can see uh, here, there are actually gonna be two rates that we deal with. For example, we have something called the instantaneous rate. The instantaneous rate would be just the, t the slope of the tangent of particular time. And so if I take this time here, t, and then figure out the slope of this line, you know, um, I have delta A over delta t here, and I have the concentration of A here and time here, then um, the delta A and delta t, delta A over delta t for this, called the instantaneous rate at time t. Instantaneous rate at t, time t. Okay, that would be the instantaneous rate. Uh, and so the, the slope, you can see the instantaneous rate is continually changing. In fact, the instantaneous rate is very steep. Here, and then it slows down. 
And so, uh, again, the rates are, are uh, people like positive numbers, so they'll take the absolute value of that. Um, just talking about how fast things are changing. Now, <coughs> uh, this makes it more difficult to predict. So, for example, if I want to know how, you know, how long does it take for 95% reaction? So let's say we started off at one molar, we end up at 0.05 molar. How long does that take? So if you start off at one molar and you end up at 0.05 molar, well, over here it's pretty easy. You know, the time it just takes is, um, you just plug it into this equation, y equals mx plus b, pretty much tells you. But over here, it, it's more of a challenge. Um, because what we have to do is we have to uh, see, you know, how uh, is this curve defined mathematically? What types of curves do we have? And so this is, this is like a, a cup of coffee. You know, if you have a, a cup of coffee, if, let's say that your cup of coffee is at 80 degrees C, how long does it take to cool down to room temperature? Is that a simple calculation? Well, it would be a simple calculation if the cooling rate were linear. And so if your, if your coffee cooled down at 5 degrees per minute, then it's simple, you know. If your coffee cooled down at 5 degrees per minute, we start at 80, we end up at 25. How many degrees is that? 80 to 25 is 55 degrees. 5 degrees per minute would be 11 minutes. But does your coffee cool down linearly, or hot tea, or whatever? Is that linear? No, it's non-linear. And so if I asked you how long would it take your coffee to cool 55 degrees to reach room temperature, is that an easy calculation? It's not an easy calculation. In fact, uh, like, I, like I said, we need, what, what do we need for that? Did I say this? Yeah, we need some calculus. But we aren't going to do the calculus. What we're going to do is we're just going to recognize the type of decay it is. And then uh, we're going to write out the equation. So we've got to see what type of decay it is. There are different ways we can see what type of decay it is. But before we see what type of decay it is, then um, we have something called the instantaneous rate, which is the slope at any point here. And we also have something called the average rate. The average rate is a slope over a time interval r rather than at a specific time t. And so if we look at the average slope or the average rate, um, we, we pick like a point, maybe a point here and a point here. And then we connect these two points with a line here. And so this would be the average slope or the average rate between time interval t1 and time interval T2. And so if I did this, you know, the slope equals the absolute value of the slope equals the average rate from T1 to T2. And you can see that the you know this even over this time interval from T1 to T2 the, the slope is changing. You know here it was much steeper actually, and here it's much less steep. Say. Um, but the average is going to be somewhere um, actually halfway between something like that. All right, so we have average rate, which is. Over a time interval, we have instantaneous rate, which is at a specific time. Over here, the average and the instantaneous rate are the exact same thing because the rate doesn't change. And so the calculations, when the rate does not change, the calculations are, are fairly simple. It's just, you know, y equals mx plus b. We can make our predictions. But when the calculations are like this, you know, how do we calculate how long something takes? Or how do we calculate, you know, after, after 30 minutes, what's the concentration? You know, can you can you tell me after 30 minutes where are we going to be? Well, over here it's easy. After 30 minutes, you just plug it in, calculate it. Over here, what do we plug it into? Because what what happens is the slope is always changing, so we don't have a constant slope. There. Slope is always changing. We got to figure it out.
Well, um, we have to recognize two um, curves that are nonlinear. And so, um, for nonlinear, there are actually more. You know, um, nonlinear, the two main curves or decays. Memorize. There are actually more, of course, but we aren't going to worry about the others. And so the two main ones we're going to um, worry about are the first order and uh, second order. And so there are a couple of ways to recognize first order. Her. What about exponential? Um, uh, first order is pretty much exponential decay. We, we would call it exponential decay. Same thing. First order is exponential decay. And um, how do we recognize this first order or exponential decay? How we recognize it, there are two ways that um, we could recognize it here. And so if this is first order, then um, one of the ways we could recognize it is by something called the half-life. So if we start at 1, we go to point 5, how long does that take? Okay, that takes this long. So we cut it in half, it takes this long. We call that T1 half, or the half-life. And so now we're at point 5, we cut it to point 0.25. If we cut it to point 0.25, we consumed half of it. How long does it take? Well, it turns out it takes exactly the same amount of time. And so this would be another half-life here. And so we have a one half-life, two half-lives, let's say. And then we start off with a 0.25 cut in half, and uh, it takes the same time interval. So this would be three half-lives. Three half-lives would be here. A four half-lives, we cut it in half again, or here. And so we have four T1 halves. And so the, the half-life, T1 half is, is a constant interval. So let's say it's 10 seconds. This would be another 10 second half-life, so 20 seconds altogether. This would be another 10 seconds, so 30 seconds altogether, and then 40. And so what we have is a constant half-life, constant T1 half. And then you can recognize, hey, this is exponential decay or first order decay. No, because it has a constant half-life. The other way of recognizing it is what happens to the instantaneous slope. If we look at the instantaneous slope, first order decay, uh, we'd see this. Uh, if we look at this, the instantaneous slope here, and then um, We cut it in half here. And so what happens to the rate with concentration is another way we can determine. Rate versus concentration of A. Let's do the concentration of A here. Time. We would see that. Uh, For this, the rate is the slope, the absolute value of the slope. This would be the instantaneous slope. And so the rate is equal to that. And it turns out that um, it's going to depend on the concentration because at higher concentrations, we have a higher rate. At lower concentrations, the rate slows down. And as the concentration gets lower and lower, the rate slows down more. 
And so the rate is going to depend on the concentration, but it's not just equal to the concentration, so we're going to put in a little constant here. This is called the rate constant, which is little k. And then it's going to be a, the concentration of a to the first power. And so it's directly proportional. The rate is directly proportional to the concentration. So that means if the concentration gets cut in half, the rate gets cut in half. And so over here, we have this as our initial rate. And then when the concentration gets cut in half, the slope gets cut in half also. So this, this slope would be one half this slope. And then as the concentration gets cut in half again, then this slope here, the instantaneous rate, would be one half this slope here. And so each time the concentration gets cut in half, the slope gets cut in half. If the concentration got cut by a third, the, the slope would get cut by a third. And so if you see a tenfold decrease in the concentration, then you're going to have a tenfold decrease in the rate. This is how coffee cools. You know, when, when you have a hot liquid, it's going to cool like this. And therefore, if, if you have, let's say, um, well, the temperature in this case, the concentration doesn't really change. This is the temperature that's changing. And so as the temperature gets cut in half, the rate of cooling slows down by half. And so as the temperature keeps dropping, this would be for coffee cooling. But in, in, in reactions, it would be the concentration that we're looking at because the temperature is not changing. You know, the temperature is constant for this reaction, or supposedly, you know, I'm looking at it like a, some kind of constant temperature. And so uh, we can predict, well, the first thing is we got to recognize that. Okay, this is uh, first order here. Okay, but now how do we predict, you know, how do we predict how long things take? Because this is always changing. Changes continuously. And so, uh, you know, initially we might be losing this much per second. But, you know, 10 seconds later, it's a totally different rate. You know, 20 seconds later, it's a totally different rate. And so we can't use this rate to make predictions. For example, how long, delta t, for how long of a concentration? Or how long would it take for a drop? You know, a drop in delta a, how long would that take? That's a delta t. We can't use this because this is always changing. So what we've got to do is we've got to do some calculus. And the calculus, this the calculus is not required for this class, but we'll just do some calculus here um, to get the equations. And so you don't need to worry about the, the calculus bit. You just have to remember the equations. And so the equations we can write in different forms. The typical form that this one is written in is, is like this. You know, if we want to calculate the, um, let's see. Um, probably, uh, we'll write it in two forms. Um, one form would be this. The, the natural log of the concentration at time t is equal to minus kt plus the natural log of the concentration at time zero, or initial. This is where t is our delta t, you know, our, our time interval, you know, so assuming we start at, 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 at zero. This would be delta t, you know, how long it takes. And so from calculus, we can generate this equation here. Well, when we generate this equation, this equation has the form y equals mx plus b. So it, so it has this form y equals mx plus b. What we can do is we can also make another plot. For example, if we plot ln of the concentration versus t, then um, it comes out linear here. And so it looks something like this. A straight line. Sometimes it's easier to analyze linear plots versus nonlinear plots. Uh huh. So you use the plot paper to do that? No. No, we don't need to do it on log paper. If we do semi-log paper, then yeah, it, it could work. We could do semi-log paper and then plot it 
but not by taking the natural log. I mean, you just take the log of both sides of the equation and then you can plot it on the papers to data points and find out the function. Well, you know, a plotting on log paper is a hassle, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and so what we do is just plot it on regular paper and then take the log of it. And so what we do first is we take the natural log of all the A values and then plot the natural log. If we plot the natural log of A versus T, then we can plot it on regular graph paper. In fact, we're going to do that today in the computer lab. And so you'll see how we do that. And so this comes out linear. So a lot of people find it easier to analyze linear plots versus nonlinear plots. So what they'll do is they'll convert this into a linear plot. When we do that, we can also do, um, you know, we can also do other things too. So for example, if we want to just do calculations, like how long it takes, um, for calculations, we, we use this. We usually use this form of the equation. The ln of a at time t divided by a at time zero is equal to minus kt. And so if we use this equation that comes from calculus, then we can calculate how long it takes you know, to go from the initial concentration, a at time zero, to some concentration at time t. Or we could, we could figure out, you know, let's say we want 95% reaction. So we start off at 1, we go to 0.05 here. We can figure out how long it takes for 95% reaction. And so for calculations, we typically use this equation here. And we can calculate how much, how long. We can't use this equation for how much delta A or how long delta T because this is always changing. Right? How much is always changing for a given time interval. But because of calculus, we could use this equation because this takes into, into account the changing slope, the changing rate of reaction. And so what we need to do is we need to recognize if this is a first order, how, how can we recognize it? Well, there are three ways to recognize it. One, the half-life is constant. Two, the slope. The slope is directly proportional to the concentration. And three, a plot of the natural log of the concentration versus T is linear. This is linear only for first order. Linear only for first order. Decay or exponential decay or whatever you want. All right, that's the... That's one nonlinear um, plot that we have to recognize. And then there's one more nonlinear plot that we have to recognize and know the math for that. All right, this is called first order. Um, the other nonlinear one is called um, second order. And so it could be a second order um, reaction, second order decay. Well, let's take a look at what second order looks like and how to recognize second order. And what are the equations for second order? For second order, the easiest way to draw it is by the half-life. So if I start off at here at the initial concentration, and then I cut it in half, and then it, it takes, let's say it takes this long, which we call um, T1 half here. If I cut this in half again, then for first order, it takes the same amount of time. But for second order, it takes twice as much time. And so we figure out what the interval here is. And then we double that interval here. And so this would be T1, the second T1 half. The second T1 half would be double the first T1 half. And so this is the second. Actually, let's do this. And so all together we have three T, well, it, it, the T one half is changing. And so this would be two times T one half, one. I will call this T one half, one. And so it takes twice as long. We're out here. All right, now the next 
half-life will take double the previous one. And so that's going to be way out here. And so this would be a, a, a total of four of the original T1 halves. And so we'll say four times T1 half one for the first T1 half. Just comma one. And so things are just taking longer and longer. This is a very slow reaction. Take a long time. And so, um, so one way of recognizing that this is a second order uh, curve is that the half lights aren't constant. The half lights are doubling each time. The next is is the if we look at the the slope, you know, the rate, which is the instantaneous slope. This is going to be delta a, concentration of A over delta T. Again, this is always changing. Always changing. And so the amount of a reaction over a specific time interval is continuously changing, which means we need calculus to do this. But we can see how the slope changes here. And when we look at the slope, which is the instantaneous um, rate, here in the slope of the tangent line, um, we have the slope initial. If we cut the if we cut the concentration in half, what we see is the slope is four times smaller. In fact, the slope is going to be one quarter <coughs> of our original slope. <coughs> this mathematical pattern is is this. The mathematical pattern for this is that the rate is going to equal k times a squared. That's a mathematical pattern in slopes. So you can just derive this equation empirically. This is called the rate law. The rate law tells us how the slope varies with concentration. And so the rate law for first order is just rate is equal to k a to the first power. Rate law for the second order is rate is equal to Ka, where K is the rate constant, A concentration, squared. And so if you cut the concentration in half, and so A would go to 1 half, 1 half squared is 1 fourth, therefore the, the slope would be 1 fourth original. If you con cut the concentration by a third, then it would be 1 ninth. And so we can see what that is. Well, um, again, what we're going to do is we're going to use some calculus to come up with something called the integrated rate laws, like we did for the first order. So we don't do that, but we do a process called integration in calculus. And so we'll just use some calculus here. And when we do that, we come up with this equation here. And probably the easiest form to use for this equation is 1 over a times t is equal to plus kt plus 1 over a at time 0. And um, it's in this form because this is the y equals mx plus b form. And it's also in this form because this is the easiest form to do calculations. We can calculate how long something takes, or delta t here, for any change in concentration. Or we can plug in a time interval and see how the concentration changes from the initial. And so, so. And so, uh, the third way of, of recognizing, you know, so the, the two ways, one, the half light doubles each successive time. Two, the rate is proportional to the square of the concentration. So the concentration gets cut in half, the rate gets cut by a quarter square. And three, if we make a plot, if we make a plot of 1 over the concentration of A versus T, then we get a, a, a linear plot like this. It's going to be linear. It's going to only be linear for second order. If I tried to um, plot a first order curve uh, like this, it would come out nonlinear. I wouldn't look very linear at all. And so
so we could do this. Now, there's a utility in doing these plots like this. One is to determine k, the slope. You know, well, there's different ways of determining the slope or k. Well, here the slope is the rate. Here, you see the slope is the rate here, not k. But we could get k from this curve by analyzing the curve. Over here, the the slope is k, and so. We can figure out what that constant k is by plotting these linearly. So if, um, if we're looking at a reaction, so for single reactant reactions like A little a, little a is just the coefficient, but little a goes to, little a, a goes to products. We could have multi-products or single product. And so what we have is like a decomposition style reaction. Well, we've got something like potassium chloride. It decomposes into potassium chloride and, and the O2, for example. KCl3 goes to KCl plus O2. And so if we're looking at something like this and um, we, we plot it, then what we're going to see is we're going to see you know, three possibilities. One possibility is linear reaction. And so the KCLO3, if we just um, monitor the KCLO3 over time, this would be a mount in this case. You can see it's linear. Or we could monitor how much O2 is produced. No. It's linear. If it's linear versus time, we call it zero order. Zero order is just linear decay. And uh, we just have the reactions for that, I mean, the equations for that. The other possibility is um, it's first order. So we'd see the exponential decay. Or it's second order. Where we'd see this kind of drawn out decay like that. Normally, figuring out the rates is kind of a hassle because you got to draw a tangent line and then get the slope of that tangent line. And so, figuring out the rates at different intervals here is a, a bit of work. The easiest thing is just to look at the half life, it, but sometimes we don't plot it long enough. Let's say we don't even get one half life in there, you don't collect enough data. And therefore, um, for first order, we'd like to make an additional plot, um, a plot of ln of A versus T will be linear. Um, actually, linear like this. With slope is kind of negative here. For second order, 1 over A versus T is linear. And so a quick way of recognizing, do we have zero order first order or second order is see which plot is linear. If the concentration of A versus T plot is linear, it's zero order. If the ln of A versus T plot is linear, it's first order. Or if the 1 over A versus T plot is linear, it's second order. And so the easiest is to graph and then determine. But on tests, you aren't going to do any graphing. On tests, you'll probably figure it out a different way. So. But in the lab, we're going to just do it this way. For multi-reactant reactions, it's more complicated.
If we only have one reactant, there's only one reactant to worry about. But if we have more than one reactant, then we got two reactants to worry about. And so what difference does it make? Well, it makes actually a lot of difference because uh, of something like this. So let's say we're looking at AA plus BB goes to product. And I'll just write product because it doesn't matter if it goes to single product or multiple products. Let's see. How it goes. It turns out that the rate is dependent on both reactants. Rate is dependent, this is an example, on both reactants. Um, so the rate law looks like this. If we look at the rate law, um, which says the rate is going to equal K, and it's going to depend on A and B. And so it depends on what order A and B are. So what we call, we don't know the order. For example, A, we'll just give it a generic order N. N equals the order with respect to A. And M will be um, the order with respect to B. So the rate depends on both. And so uh, let's do another uh, example here. Let's, uh, for example, if n equals 1 and m equals 1, if m and n are both 1, then what we say, it's first order in A. first order in A and first order in B. And so it, it, it would appear that um, if I make a plot of the concentration of A versus time, what would it look like? Well, if it's first order, then we recognize what a first order curve looks like, right? probably can draw a first order curve out. And so we would try to draw out the first order curve in A. How would I draw? Well, I use half lives. And so this would be a first order in A, right? But what we see is um, it's, it doesn't look like this. You know what's observed? What's observed is a Second order. Why? Uh, the reason the second order is observed is because if A gets cut in half, so does B. And if A and B both get cut in half, then the rate gets cut in half by A, and the rate gets cut in half by B. And so this is what happens here. Rate is equal to k. Now, if a gets cut in half, it would be 1 half to the first. If b gets cut in half, because let's say it's a 1 to 1 reaction. So for 1 to 1 reaction. And so let's say we're, we're starting with a plus b. We start off at 1 here, 1 here. This is initial. And there's a change, and then at this point, which we call um, T1, let's say T1 half, A gets cut in half, B gets cut in half. It's a one to one stoichiometry here. So if A gets cut in half, that's one half to the first, B gets cut in half, that's one half to the first, then the rate gets cut by one quarter. 
One half times one half is one quarter, so we'll get one quarter k. This is called the overall. And so this is first order in A, first order in B, but second order overall. And it's the overall rate that we're going to observe here. And so A is going to be impacted by how B screws things up. If A gets cut in half, B is going to get cut in half too. And so we end up with a second order overall. And so what we see is that the composite order is observed. Because when A gets cut in half, B also gets cut in half. When A is cut in half, B is also cut in half. Assuming we start with this ice table here. If we don't start with this ice table, it could be slightly different. It could be even more complicated. Because, um, for example, if we started with 1 to 3 ratio here, if we had a 1 to 3 ratio, then A would get cut in half, and B would go from 3 to 2 and a half. Well, going from 3 to 2 and a half is going to screw up the overall order. Does that make sense? Or not? All right, so here A and B get cut in half because we start off with one, with one to one stoichiometry to products. And so that means A gets cut in half, B gets cut in half, the rate gets cut by quarter. But if A gets cut in half here, and let's say B was in excess, so it's a one-to-one -one ratio, so minus a half here, minus a half here, I get left with two and a half. If I get two and a half here, then the, it's going to be this. It's going to be one half to the first times three halves, which is going to give me three quarters. The rate gets cut by three quarters. So when we're dealing with multiple reactants, things get complicated very quickly. Because both reactants will impact the overall rate of reaction. And what we observe is the overall rate of reaction. We don't observe the individual rates because both of these are tied together. It's like multiple equilibria. You have to do multiple equilibria together. You can't treat them separately. The same thing with kinetics. You can't treat A and B separately because they're tied together. What we observe is the composite of both of them working together. So multiple equal, uh, multiple reactant equal, um, excuse me, let me back up. Multiple reactant kinetics is not easy because we're going to get all kinds of weird orders based on how both reactants are more are changing. So what did we do in lab last time? Well, we did two reactants. So what we did in lab was uh, this. We did a crystal violet chloride plus um, sodium hydroxide, which led to crystal violet hydroxide plus sodium chloride. And so we have two re reactants. What, what we did was we, we made a plot of crystal violet, the crystal violet chloride concentration. The crystal violet chloride is the purple. Crystal violet hydroxide is colorless. And so we just monitored this. And that we saw it was nonlinear. 
right? We saw that it was nonlinear. And so what we're going to do, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to figure out what kind of decay is this? Um, is this a um, zero, first, or second order decay? And so what we're going to do is we're going into the computer lab and we're going to make some plots. We're going to plot the CV versus time concentration, the ln of CV versus time, and the 1 over CV versus time and see which one's linear. So um, we'll do that together in the computer lab. Well, obviously the CV versus time is nonlinear, so it's not zero order. And then um, we do the LN of the CVCL versus time. And uh, when we do this, let's see how linear it is. What we want to do is we want to do a trend line fit. And then we select the linear option. And then there are two check boxes. We check the box for display equation at the bottom of the window. And we check the box for display R squared. Have you heard of R squared? R squared is, is called the um, correlation. factor. And uh, R squared tells us the fit of the data points with the trend line. If it's a perfect fit, that is every single data point is exactly on the line, then the R squared is 1. This is a perfect fit. If you have an R squared of about 0.96, um, this is not good. Even though it sounds good, you know, 0.96 is very close to 1. What we're typically looking for R squareds are like 3 nines or more, you know, 0.999 or 0.9999, 4 nines or 5 nines. The more nines we have, the better. 2 nines is okay. But 1, 9 we're starting to get. And then if, if we get 1, 9 and a 6, then it's not looking so good um, for the fit here. And then we'll do this versus the 1 over A. The 1 over the concentration of the crystal violet chloride over time. You know, we compare the R squared. Yes. You compare the R squared values and you see which one's the best. So for example, if we tried to fit this curve here like this, this this might be of like a 0.93 fit here. You know, does that look like a good correlation? No, this would be a poor fit. So yeah, I'm just guessing R squared, maybe about 0.93 or something. It's pretty bad. And so we're looking for something that's good. What did it look like to you, eyeball-wise? Did it look like an exponential decay or an extended out? All right. Well, let's say it, it looks like an exponential decay, so it would be first order here. Now, the question is this. If it's first order overall, because this is what we're seeing in the plot, we're seeing the overall composite rate. And so if it's first order overall, 
let's say if this were linear, if linear, then first order overall It does not mean it's first order in crystal violet chloride. It means it's first order overall because what we're going to see is the impact of both reactants changing. And so if it's first order overall, it could be that it's first order in crystal violet and zero order in sodium hydroxide. What zero order means is it doesn't depend on the concentration at all. You know, um, zero order would be, I, I, I forgot to write this, but in um, earlier when we were looking at this, the rate is equal to K, which is equal to the, um, which is equal to the slope. I think I miswrote it. But anyway, it's going to be K A to the concentration to the zeroth power. And so the rate is just equal to K, which is just equal to the slope we talked about earlier. This is from before, so. This is a zero order. Uh, as the concentration changes, nothing happens to the slope. So if it's first order overall, does it mean it's first order in crystal violet and zero order in sodium hydroxide? Or does it mean it's zero order in crystal violet and first order in sodium hydroxide? Or does it mean it's second order in crystal violet and negative one order? We could have negative orders too. We could have different orders. A negative one order in sodium hydroxide? Because, you know, 2 and minus 1 would add up to first order overall. And so what does that mean? Because the overall order is equal to M plus N plus, depends on how many reactants. If we have more reactants, we'd add more terms. But here we have two terms. So what we got is we got two unknowns in one equation. We know it's first order overall, but we don't know the order with respect to crystal violet chloride, and we don't know the order with respect to sodium hydroxide. So how can we figure out which, what M and N are? Uh-huh. Uh, the second concentration. The second equation. Okay, um, well there are different ways of doing this. And so let me, um, let me tell you how we're going to do it here. How we're going to do this is um, this. This is why we had to do two experiments. You know, if there weren't two unknowns here, then we could just do one experiment. We'd be done, you know? We just do one experiment. We say, hey, it's zero order, first order, or second order in crystal violet chloride. But since there are two unknowns, we, we don't know what, what it is because we're just going to see the composite of the two. And so, um, to determine. M, what we do is um, we make, to determine M, make the sodium hydroxide concentrations so large, so large that it Should I say it, it um, barely changes over the course of the reaction? And so, for example, here, if we look at the crystal violet chloride and um, plus the sodium hydroxide, and we look at the initials. We make the initial sodium hydroxide so large, and then the crystal violet chloride is just normal. And so, for example, when we lose minus one half of this, which is going to be, um, it's a one to one mole ratio, so it's going to be minus one half of this. And so, let's say half the reaction is taking place. Well, at the end of this, we'll have. Um, half of it left over, so we're going to have one half of the crystal violet chloride left over. Yeah, I 
initial, one half of the initial. But over here, let's say we make this huge. If we make this number huge, let's say we make this 0.1 molar and we make this 10 molar, and so we lose 0.05, or we make this 0.001 molar and make this 10 molar. In other words, if we make this number huge, then we barely lose any of it. And so this comes out to about the same. You know, and in fact, this is going to equal the sodium hydroxide initial, I might as well write it out, minus one half of the crystal violet chloride initial. And we make this huge, this is small, therefore the change is negligible, and we'll just say it's going to be about it, the same. And so it's a huge waste of sodium hydroxide, but we need to waste the sodium hydroxide. We're going to put a tremendous excess of sodium hydroxide in there and waste most of it. But the advantage here is this. If the sodium hydroxide concentration doesn't really change, then the sodium hydroxide is not going to have any impact on the rate. And therefore, the rate is just going to depend on the change in crystal violet chloride concentration. This is called pseudo-M order in this technique. And so pseudo-M order is just trying to do this. We know the rate is going to depend on the composite of the crystal violet chloride and the sodium hydroxide concentration. And the crystal violet is going to be to the M, sodium hydroxide is to the N. We make this very large, therefore it's fairly constant. If the concentration of sodium hydroxide becomes a constant, then we'll combine these two constants to get K prime. And so now the con concentration of crystal violet chloride is the only thing that's going to impact the rate because the sodium hydroxide is constant. And this is where K prime is the pseudo M order constant, rate constant, which is equal to K, the original rate constant, times the sodium hydroxide concentration initial. That's exactly what we did in this, even though uh, you were just mixing them up. The, the sodium hydroxide concentration was huge in this experiment, way more than what we needed to react with crystal violet chloride. And the reason for making the sodium hydroxide concentration so big is so that we can eliminate its impact on the overall rate. And so now the overall rate is only dictated by the crystal violet chloride. Therefore, a plot of crystal violet chloride will tell us M, you know, is M zero, one, or two? Well, it depends on which one's linear. Okay. Well, uh, that means we still don't know what N is. We still don't know what N is. And so N, we're going to get by something called uh, the method of initial rates. N is determined by a modified version of the method of initial rates. So let me talk about the method of initial rates first. And so what's the unmodified version of the method of initial rates? Let's say we're looking at a reaction AA plus BB goes to product. The rate law says this. The rate law says that um, the rate is equal to K, and it's going to depend on the concentration of A, how it changes. But it's to the n power. A and M are not equal. 
necessarily. They might be the same, they might not be. We can't assume that they're going to be the same thing. And B is to the n power. And again, B and n may or may not be the same number. And so M and N are unknowns. And so with the method of initial rates, we do this. The rate 1, OK, we'll say the initial rate. Now, what is the initial rate? The initial rate is a bit of a pain to determine. The initial rate is equal to the uh, slope of the tangent at time 0. And so, um, what we do is uh, we, we would just take the, uh, we'd have to draw the line here, and then draw the tangent at time zero, this, and then get the um, rate here from the slope, the, the negative of the slope. Rate is equal to the, to the negative of the slope. That's a bit of a pain. And so this is a bit of a pain. So, um, so what we could say is this. Or the average slope or rate when less than 5% reaction has occurred. This is a little easier than drawing a tangent at time 0. And that is, it, it, let's say we start off at 1.0 here and we end up at 0.95 here. And so we have a data point here. Let's say our next data point is here. And uh, what we'll do is we'll just take the average slope, not the instantaneous slope, um, as long as the two data points are less than 5% reaction here, then we'll just say that um, it's close enough. Because in reality, it's a curve, right? So we're going to see a curve here. And so initially, it might be a little faster, and here it might be a little slower, and so we'll just take the average that rather than figuring out the instantaneous slopes. And so this is close. It's going to be a slight error, of course, um, but uh, it's close. Problem is, is did we measure, did we measure the initial rate at time zero? At time zero, you're still pipetting. And the problem is, is this. When the first drop of crystal violet hits the sodium hydroxide, it starts reacting, and the concentrations start changing. So we have no idea what the concentrations are or were when you put that in. Well, we can figure it out, but um, when you put that into the spectrometer. But if we did have the initial rate, you know, if we did have the initial rate, then um, it's actually pretty easy because what we do is we do this. We take the initial rate, and then um, we look at different initial concentrations. So we'll have the initial concentration of A and the initial concentration of B. And so we'll say this, this rate for run one, rate for run two, and uh, actually we would need um, three runs to do this. We need run three. And so what we do here is we would double A. And so here, um, this would be uh, run one. And uh, we, in run two, we double the concentration of A. But leave B the same. So B in run one is the same as B in run two. And so if B stays the same, that has no impact. So we double A, and then we see what happens. If we double A and nothing happens, then we call it zero order in A because A had no impact. 
If we double A and the rate doubled, then it's directly proportional to A, which is first order. If we double A and the rate quadrupled, then it's second order in A because uh, second order depends on the square of concentration. Okay, so by doubling A, we just observe what happens to the rate. Does it stay the same? Did it double or did it quadruple? And they'll tell us this. At least it for zero first and second. Okay, then we leave A the same. And so in run three, I'd make A the same and then double B. If I double B, I just look. What happened to the rate? Did it double, quadruple, or stay the same? Those are the choices. And in this way, I could do it, but I'd have to do three experiments here. I could have done it here. I could have done three experiments here. We could have done the same thing, doubled it. But we didn't. We only did B. But that's okay because we figured out what A is based on the plot. We're going to figure out what B is based on the initial rate. But we didn't. We didn't measure the initial rate. We don't have data at time zero at our true time zero. So how are we going to do this? All right. So I, I made you um, reference. You know what time? You know half half of the crystal violet went in. But we aren't going to use that. We're just going to use our, our zero time in the spectrometer as our initial. You know, once, once you put it into the spectrometer, time zero is when you started the run. That, when you started the run, we don't have the concentration there. We could figure out what the concentration is if we know Beer's law. Well, we could figure it out, but um, we aren't going to because what we're going to do is this. Which one went faster, run one or run two? Run one went faster. Okay, so let's do rate of run one over rate of run two. So one was faster. Okay, now that's going to equal this. Um, for, for our experiment, for the crystal violet chloride, it's going to equal K times the crystal violet chloride to the M times the sodium hydroxide to the N. Okay, this is um, run one, run one. In run two, was the crystal violet the same or the? Not. It was a 10 to 30, so it's gonna be the same. However, the sodium hydroxide was one half, right? And so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna just say this is run two and I'm going to change this. I'm going to say that the sodium hydroxide up here is two times run two. Sorry. This is going to be two times the sodium hydroxide of run two. So what we did was in going from run two to run one, we doubled the sodium hydroxide. Okay, this is to the end. Well, when we look at this, take a look. Um, K, it's the same reaction, so the Ks cancel out. The crystal violets cancel out. And the sodium hydroxides cancel out. And so what we end up with is 2 to the N. But the problem is, is we don't have rate 1 and rate 2. We don't know what that is, the initial. And so this is unknown. And so we still can't solve this. But we do have this. We do, we know that we did the pseudo in order. When we did the pseudo in order, then what we got is this. We got K prime times the um, crystal violet chloride. Both runs had a huge excess of sodium hydroxide. And so even though we, we cut run two by half, it was still a huge excess. And so this would be K prime for run one times the crystal violet of run one to the M divided by K prime two. Now K prime one and K prime two are different because K prime two had half the concentration, K prime one had double the concentration. 
times the crystal violet chloride of, of run one to the m. These cancel out. And so we get this equation. Two to the nth is equal to k prime one over k prime two. And so the pseudo rate constants are going to be different because we, we, we doubled the sodium hydroxide concentration, which is going to have an impact on the rate. This is where k prime 1 is equal to k times the sodium hydroxide concentration to the mth power for run 1. And k prime 2 is equal to k times the sodium hydroxide concentration of run 2 to the mth power. And both of these we could solve for k. Solve for, uh, after we do this. First we'll solve for n. Solve for n. M n. Solve for n, sorry. Solve for n. And then we're going to solve for k. And so we're going to get k from here and a k from here. Both these k should be the same and then we're just going to average the k to get the average k value. And so the goal of, of this is to determine the rate law of the crystal violet chloride sodium hydroxide reaction. And um, basically we, we have all the required information. And we aren't going to do anything else. We aren't going to come up with an integrated rate law because the integrated rate law is a little bit too complicated. So we're going to get Ka to the m b to the n. And so we want to know what k is equal to, we want to know what m is equal to, and we want to know what n is equal to. We're going to get that. And therefore, we can plug in any concentration of a and any concentration of b and figure out what the overall rate is, what the slope is going to be at that concentration. And so we get the rate law. The integrated rate law, we need multivariable calculus for. And this is getting beyond the scope of this class. But, you know, it's done. People do it all the time. It's not that difficult actually, but it is more difficult, so we aren't going to do it. And so we are not going to do calculus. We are not going to do calculus. Well, we really didn't do any calculus anyway. We just got the equation from there, but we are not going to do calculus on this multivariable thing. Um, we're just going to leave it at that. And so if we wanted to predict how long it would take, uh, well, we aren't going to do that. We could predict how long it would take if we made it pseudo M order. You know, that pseudo M order meaning um, cancel out one of the reactants. Or pseudo N order. You know, we could make the crystal violet so large and then just see how the sodium hydroxide. But if we made the, the concentrations the same, same initial, then forget it. We aren't going to figure out how long it takes. I guess we could do it. I mean, if they were the same initial, we could just assume it's second order and then figure it out. So we could do it, but we could only do it for a special case where they're equal initial concentrations. Otherwise, um, it would get complicated. All right, are there any questions on this? So we're going to move over into the computer lab now, and uh, we're going to work up the data uh, for this. And so we'll do it together, uh, make the plots up and stuff.